So please welcome Associate Professor in Machine Learning from the University of Oxford, Michael Osborne. Okay, so um, I'm delighted to be here. And the topic of my talk this morning will be on the future of employment, and in particular how the new digital technologies we're all here to discuss might actually affect job markets worldwide. But before I do, I'd like to talk about the history of employment. And in particular, I'd like you to cast your mind back to the year 1589, when a gentleman by the name of William Lee, an Englishman, invented the stocking frame knitting machine, a device that was essentially designed to automate the process of knitting and weaving. So he was quite optimistic and positive about his invention and approached the monarch of England of the time, Queen Elizabeth I, for patent protection, only to be turned down. And as you can see in the quote, the objection the Queen had was exactly that of technological unemployment. She was concerned about the impact of this technology on the livelihood of her subjects. So in fact, so severe was the opposition to William's invention that he was forced out of England altogether, in particular by the political pressure um, of the guilds in England at the time. So the point I wanted to make is that this fear of technological unemployment is absolutely nothing new, but in fact, we haven't seen much evidence of it throughout the historical record. So one stat that sort of highlights that Consider that in 1900, about 40% of all US employment was engaged in agriculture, whereas at the end of the 20th century, that figure was less than 2%. So a completely transformational change in the nature of employment in the US solely due to technology. Yet despite that change, we didn't really see long-lasting changes in unemployment. So at the beginning of the 20th century, the unemployment rate was about 5%. At the end of the 20th century, the unemployment rate was about 5%. So in our work, we've set out to answer the question to what extent that might continue, whether or not employment might continue to resist technological trends. And the other question we set out to answer was that if there are jobs that come under threat due to these new technologies, where will they be? Which kind of workers will be most at risk due to technological change? So the narrative we're perhaps most familiar with from the 20th century is that of low-skilled workers having their jobs replaced by technology. So I'm thinking about telephone switchboard operators in particular. But that's not actually been the story over most of our recorded history. So if we think back to William Lee's time, the people who were put out of work by technology were actually, uh, actually relatively high-skilled. It was the guildsmen who were exerting the political pressure on William, relatively high-skilled artisans who were able to convert a product all the way from raw materials into a finished product who were put out of work. So we set out to think about where this uh, burden of technological unemployment might lie looking forwards over the next couple of decades. So the question you might ask then is, what is different now? Why might we think that the historical patterns might not be repeated in the future? And my answer to that would be that actually advances in my own field, that of machine learning, a subfield of artificial intelligence, mean that now we're able to create technologies that can automate not just routine manual labor, as we've seen throughout the historical record, but are increasingly able to substitute for human workers in cognitive labor, intellectual labor. And it's not surprising to think that the consequences of that might be quite profound. So a related question is, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to substitute human cognitive labor with that of machines? And to illustrate one motivation for that, I'd like to point out one of my favorite studies of all time, which was a survey of Israeli judges from 2011 who were tasked with awarding parole or not to, to prisoners. So the study authors tracked the fraction of times that they did award parole as a function of the ordinal position in the day. So I think I have a laser point here. This is the probability of them making a favorable decision, and this is the ordinal position in the day. And you can see that they start out the day fairly positive towards the prisoners, but as the morning wears on, they become less and less likely to award parole, only to be perked up by lunch, only for that to decline, sorry, to be perked up by their morning coffee, only for that to decline leading into lunch, and subsequent to lunch, it's more or less a complete write-off, as you can see. So I'm aware that we're somewhere around here in the day's proceedings, so I'll beg your forbearance. We'll see if we can get through the rest of the session despite the cognitive burden you might be bearing uh, absent coffee. So the point here I'm trying to make is that 
we want to use algorithms for work because they're absent human heuristics and biases. They can make decisions unclouded by the kind of constraints that are placed upon our own cognition. And the other reason you might want to prefer an algorithm to a human is if you're thinking about doing any kind of processing on data, I hope it's intuitive to everyone that you probably want to be doing that with a room full of computers circa 2014, rather than a room full of computers circa 1949, as you can see on the slide here. We, we really are able to just do more computation in a scalable way with digital devices than we can with humans. And um, a consequence or related fact is that the costs of any single unit of comp computing have continued to decline for going on almost a century now. So I'm sure you've seen a plot like this in the past, but this is the cost of a single unit of computing on the y-axis as a function of time, all the way back from 1940 to the current day. And you can see there really has been this long-running decline in the cost of computing, with the uh, obvious exception of the iPad 2, a, a clear outlier there. So um, again, an associated fact drawn from the incredible decline in the cost of computing is that we have much more data available now than we've ever had in the past. And I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with the phrase big data, a real buzzword, but nonetheless contains a kernel of truth about what we have at our disposal today. So to put some numbers to the phenomenon, consider the following estimates. So an estimate made of the information contained in all printed material in the world today is about 200 petabytes. An estimate of the information contained in all the words ever spoken by human beings is about five exabytes. But both of those figures are completely dwarfed by the information contained in the predicted internet traffic just next year, which is expected to approach one zettabyte. So it's not surprising with this completely unprecedented quantity of information at our disposal, we might be able to do more with an algorithm than we've been able to do in the past. So we're seeing some consequences of this for employment already, exactly driven by big data and machine learning algorithms. One example of automation led by machine learning you might be familiar with is that of Google Translate. So perhaps you've had the opportunity to use Google Translate. It's, it's pretty effective at translating text from one language to another. And the way it works is very much driven by big data. So Google Translate is built on a corpus of 200 billion words drawn from UN documents, which are required to be translated into six different languages. So when Google Translate wants to translate a particular bit of text, it can dig through that data, find a phrase that's relatively close to that which is desired to be translated, and then return the translation immediately. So what I'm getting at here is that algorithms are able to use big data to perform tasks that might once only have been performable by human beings. So we're also seeing many other applications in which the ability of algorithms to dig through data to process it exceed that of uh, humans. So we're seeing, for example, job losses in paralegal, contract lawyer, and patent lawyer occupations, where algorithms are better able to dig to case, through case files than perhaps humans are. And one of the most prominent technologies currently that people are considering to have quite um, fundamental implications for employment is that of autonomous vehicles. And to highlight just how quickly this kind of technology has advanced, as recently as 2004, prominent economist Levi Menane claimed that it was hard to imagine discovering the set of rules that could replicate a driver's behavior. And yet, of course, less than a decade later, we had the Google car license to drive in the state of Nevada. So as a consequence of these autonomous driving technologies, we will see a whole host of logistics occupations coming under threat. I'm thinking here about technologies we're already seeing. The fuzzy little fella up in the upper right here is the QC bot, automating the task of delivering meals and medicines around a hospital. We're going to see the rise of autonomous mining vehicles. And uh, this guy here is a robot deployed by the Orchid Supply Hardware Store in California, really serving as an autonomous sales assistant. So the next question, of course, is, so if machines can drive, serve customers, and dig through data, what are we still actually good for? So another component of our study was to try and identify the bottlenecks to automation, the kinds of things that we don't foresee being automated over the next couple of decades. 
So the first two of those bottlenecks were creativity and social intelligence. And I hope both of those uh, appear relatively intuitive to you. Both creativity and social intelligence draw upon very deep, intuitive, tacit knowledge that we have as human beings. And that deep reservoir of knowledge is very difficult to encode into an algorithm. It's difficult to teach an algorithm the difference between a good painting and a bad painting, for example, in a way that human beings are quite well equipped to, to do. And the final bottleneck we identified was that of the manipulation of complex objects in unstructured environments. So this is a more subtle point. Um, for a number of decades now, optimists within my own discipline have been forecasting that any day now we'd have a robotic housemaid. And of course, as I'm sure you're all aware, that's not something we currently have at our disposal. And the challenge there is very much that of interacting with objects in a human environment that we're able to understand, but that algorithms are relatively unable to. Contrast this against the task of automating warehousing, as performed by Kiva Robotics, brought out by Amazon a couple of years ago, where the environment is much more structured, well-engineered, to allow robots to perform the required task. So to put some numbers on exactly what the consequences for employment would be, we analyzed a data set of 702 occupations from the US, each of which we have a uh, representation of the components of skill involved in that particular job. So for each of those jobs, we have a measurement of the requirement for persuasion, social intelligence, uh, the manipulation of complex objects required, all features we thought might be predictive of the automatability of those occupations. So then using exactly machine learning algorithm, we were able to predict the probability of computerization of all those occupations. And some of the jobs we found to be at most risk included telemarketers, tax preparers, and insurance appraisers, all occupations that really rely upon digging through data in a way that algorithms are perhaps better suited. Some of the jobs we found least at risk were those of occupational therapists, mental health counselors, and primary school teachers, all of which involve one or more of those bottlenecks we identified, all of which probably involve some degree of social intelligence or creativity that aren't going to be readily automated. So the headline figure then that you might have already seen was that for the US, we expect about 47% of current employment to be at high risk of automation over the next 20 years. And in a recent follow-up study with Deloitte, we identified the equivalent figure for the UK to be about 35%. So really, in either case, a really quite enormous number of jobs coming under threat as a result of these new technologies. But for me, the more alarming figure is that the burden of these jobs is actually going to be most heavily felt upon the shoulders of those at the lowest skilled end of the spectrum. So in follow-up work for Nesta, we found that creative jobs were relatively non-automatable, as you might expect. But we found that the jobs that were most automatable were exactly those that were relatively low-paid or low-educated. So I think this is the most alarming finding of our work. It says that the inequality we've already seen develop in our societies can only really be expected to worsen as a result of these kinds of technologies. The jobs that will come under threat are exactly those that are most currently low-skilled. But to conclude briefly, I, I just wanted to say that I wouldn't be working in the field I am, that of machine learning, if I didn't feel that there were also enormous positive societal consequences as a result of the technologies we're developing. So to illustrate that, again, I'd like you to cast your minds back through the fog of history to the 1950s and earlier, where we saw the introduction of technologies such as the automatic washing machine. So while we take these technologies for granted today, it's worth just remembering the amount of backbreaking work that formerly had to go into performing these kinds of tasks and the extent to which the introduction of these technologies have freed up, in particular, women to engage in the workplaces of today. So looking forwards, I see that there will continue to be these kinds of positive consequences of algorithms automating away tedious or um, you know, unnecessary work, work that could be better performed by a machine that really shouldn't be performed by human beings. 
And the three bottlenecks that we identified, those of creativity, social intelligence, and the ability to interact with complex objects, I think will be the kind of core features of the jobs of the coming decades. And I'd like to point out that all three of these features are really characteristic of what we do for fun. I think we as human beings enjoy being creative and social, and I think it's a positive thing to think of the future jobs containing yet more of those components. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, can I, uh, we do have a couple of microphones in the room for questions. Can I just ask you, though, perhaps going back to what Vittorio said about whether it's realistic to be optimistic in this age. I mean, you have painted quite an alarming picture, mm. um, you know, especially for uh, you know, a whole swathe of people with low skills facing even fewer opportunities than they do at the moment. Can you really say, therefore, that at the end of it, you can be optimistic? So, I mean, clearly there are quite profound challenges for society to respond to some of these developments. I, I would certainly not deny that. What I would like to see is that society doesn't reject these technologies wholesale as a consequence of those threats. I think we need to try and find a way to make both the best of the technologies and to kind of somehow avoid the worst possible consequences. And I think really those are challenges for policymakers mm. to make sure that all can share in the enormous wealth that will be created as a result of these new technologies. Okay. Um, could you raise your hand if you've uh, got a, a question? And we've uh, got a couple of microphones in the room. Gosh. Okay. Well. Vittorio? Yep. Oh. This is really a fascinating. Quick question because we have been debating it last night. Uh, it's clear that the answer to this is more education. And it's clear that the answer to this is, as I was saying in my remarks, more education on new skills. Now, uh, how quickly do you think the speed of uh, adoption of technology will be relative to the speed uh, of education, which uh, uh, we know takes 15 years, usually, you know, to, to really have an impact. And is there a possibility that everything will be good and optimistic at the end, but we'll have a period during which there will be a gap between the two speeds? Hmm. So you highlight some, you know, really profound challenges for education. I, I agree that, you know, Fixing education in some way is the key to making sure that all can really benefit from these technologies. The good news for education is that education itself will benefit from the rise of some of these technologies. So we're already seeing the introduction of MOOCs, for example, massive open online courses. They're able to deliver education at scale to make sure that all digital citizens of the world can share in some of the highest quality education that's available. And I think in particular in my field, that of machine learning, there's a fair amount of work to make sure that we can um, well, to design essentially algorithmic tutors, uh, machines that are capable of delivering interactive education in the same way that a teacher might. So I think the possibilities of these technologies are really quite important. I think we might be able to change education in a way that we haven't seen in the past because we'll be able to harness the speed of um, advances in software as we're able to use software to deliver education, with us able to keep up with advances in software elsewhere in the economy. Thank you so much, um, Michael. Thanks for setting out the challenge um, so clearly. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Osborne.